ready for the word this morning? I'm excited to preach it. Uh, I had a great time at first. Isn't that worship killer? Oh, you didn't. <laughs> Listen, I'd put up our worship team by anybody in America. I paid $75 to go sit and listen to them sing in Century 2. And I got to tell you, they ain't better than this. They have better light shows, but they ain't better than this. And uh, so I hope you appreciate it and enjoy it and tell somebody you like it. Amen? Uh, over the years, I've had lots of things speak to me. But several months ago, Annie and I were talking and we were talking about things. And this language came to me uh, about the purpose of my life specifically. And I think the mission of this church, and it's, it's morphed a little bit. But encouraging one another to enjoy the fullness, encouraging you to know the fullness of knowing, loving, and becoming like Jesus. I really believe that that's my assignment uh, to encourage you to enjoy the fullness of knowing, loving, and becoming like Christ. Now, I, I'm ready to preach this message. It's going to set the stage for several weeks here through the summertime uh, that we're going to try to unpack for you. Um, but before I do, do you know everything is changed by context? It, given the context of the comments, uh, changes. I mean, when Christ speaks from the cross, the context of his words are empowered because he's hanging on a cross. I mean, because he's hanging on a cross and he said, Father, forgive them. It, it, it adds something to the word. I mean, you and I can say, I forgive you, but none of us are stretched out on a cross. So context matters. And many people read the text of the scriptures and they take it out of the context and thus it loses some of its value. I'm going to give you some context. Uh, the Old Testament, they got the Ten Commandments. How many know there's Ten Commandments in the Old Testament? And, and they tell you what to do and what not to do, right? Uh, and, and you know that. Uh, and, and, and so I'm going to, but I'm going to read a couple of verses to you. It's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Just one verse out of here that I, I want to set this up. Romans 8 verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man. Say with me, the law, the law. couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So God sent his son to do what the law, do you know uh, the law will never change anybody? Did you know that those Pharisees that Christ came and talked with, they, they supposedly kept the law, but they were unkind people? They, they were actually, they killed. These people that said they kept the law murdered the Son of God. Are you listening to me? The law will never transform anyone. It maybe will alter their behavior, but it won't change their hearts. So you can, you can go ahead and impose all the rules you want to, but it won't change people's hearts. For the law was powerless to do it. So God sent his son. Say, Jesus did it. Now let me read it to you out of the Message Bible. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote or unimportant. Sin is important. It, you don't want to do it. He didn't deal with it as though it was unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took upon human condition and entered into the disordered mess of struggling humanity. In order to set it right once and for all, the law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up losing. It was used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. There are two philosophical worldview stances in the gospel, and they are at play in our culture today. Some people think that if you teach people all the law and they obey all the law, that they can get to heaven. Right? And then some of us believe that Jesus died and forgave us our sins. And then he invited us to follow him. And that by hanging out with him and letting who he is rub off on us, that we are mentored by that goodness of him and that we are transformed by our relationship with him. One of those is called grace. And the other one is called legalism. But at play 
in America and around the world is this resurgence that we will force the law on people and we will evaluate them. And if you don't keep it, you're going to hell. That's a philosophical view of the Word of God. That is not my view. My view is that Jesus died for our sins, that he rose again, and that he came into my heart, and that today there's a process of sanctification. There's a process wherein his goodness begins to transform me, and I become more and more like him by living with him. Am I in the room with anybody else? Now, you have to understand that context when people ask me, what about the Father's house? I have to go, oh, well. Because even in this community, this exists. Even across the streets, it exists. And people were murdered during the first three centuries of the church because they believed Jesus is Lord. Am I making any sense? So if you're going to live in this atmosphere and hear what I'm about to say, you got to understand the worldviews. You got to understand the philosophical understanding, the hermeneutics in which we interpret the scripture. Anybody get it? Okay. So I'm going to go to the Beatitudes because I believe the Beatitudes are Christ's response to the Pharisees. Christ's response to that. Matthew chapter 5, reading in verse 3, and I'm reading in the Good News translation. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. How many of you know you're just spiritually bankrupt? That if, the, if we catch you on the wrong day, you're not very spiritual. <laughs> In fact, if we catch you at the wrong time of day, you're not very... How many of you have just been pretty carnal at times? Happy are those who know they're spiritually bankrupt. The kingdom of heaven belongs to the people who acknowledge I can't do this on my own. Yeah. Mm. Happy are those who mourn, have suffered loss. God will comfort them. Anybody in here suffered something? Okay. Happy are those who are humble, for they shall receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Yeah. Happy are those who are merciful, forgiving to other people, for God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are those that work for peace and not division. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are you when people insult you, persecute you, and tell you all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Anybody here happy this morning? Anybody here understand that you may have greed, loss, that others may talk bad about you, that, that you have to forgive over and over again the insults of other people, but God says that if you live a human existence that is completely dependent upon him, you shall be happy. happy. Wow. Happiness is that elusive emotion, right? Everybody wants happiness. Everybody, God wants everybody to be happy, but it's hard to define, and it's hard to find that hunger for happiness explains everything we do. It explains why we buy what we buy, because we think it'll make us happy. It explains the relationships that we have, because we think it'll make us. It explains the jobs, the hobbies, the clothes, even the food that we eat, because we think there are things that will make us happy. I don't need the Declaration of Independence to tell me that I have a pursuit for happiness. I was born hungry. I was born with desire to be happy, to enjoy life. And in our culture, the society in which we live, it tells us that the more money and more power and more pleasure that we have, we are happy. I, I think that's not true. I think the unfeathered pursuit of self-gratification leads to even more unhappiness. You buy a kid one toy, they just want another toy. I, I think that, however, if we follow the path of Jesus, we'll discover the most satisfying life that is not governed by self-interest or self-gratification. I think if you listen to Christ, he talks about happy comes to people who are good and kind and merciful and forgiving, people who love serving other people. I believe Jesus came to show us the prototype or the best 
of what it means to be a human being living on a dependence of the grace of God. I believe and I suspect that we somehow search and desire and long for what brings us delight and peace and gives meaning to our lives. You see, we all seek that which we love. The question is not that we love or don't love, but what is it that we love? Because what it is that you love, what is it that you desire, will determine the choices that you make. I actually believe that we are called to live a good and beautiful life. I believe we're called to be the best of God revealed through this human experience. I believe that Christian ethics and morality will lead us into that fullness, that happiness, and that we, as we advance in the discovery that we were created by a good God and that he looked at us and said, you're very good, that innately and inerrant in every human being is the very goodness of God that's been covered up by self-seeking gratification. Amen. This means that in order to flourish or excel as human beings, we have to discover what is good. We have to understand that goodness and that happiness is the result of being and becoming that thing. I think that happiness is more than an emotional state. I believe whether it is a way of being, a way of living, a, a way of seeking all that is good and beautiful and true because we understand that's part of who God is. It's more than having our desires met. It's much more than that. I love what St. Augustine says. He says, our hearts are restless until we rest in thee. God is the one that satisfies my hunger. God is the agape that comes into my life and releases my potential through his touch and through his mercy and his grace. I believe every one of us are on a journey of becoming like Christ. I think we need to learn the attitudes, the habits, and the practices that are conducive to that reality. I believe that Jesus spent a lot of time talking about happiness. Happy is this, happy is this, happy is. In contrast to the world, he speaks of mercy and peacemaking and justice and kindness. I believe that those beatitudes of happiness are his answer and response to the pharisaical reality of the law. I believe happiness is his trademark, that he wants you to have his joy and live in that reality. I believe, as St. Thomas said, that Jesus is happiness. That to be in his presence is fullness of joy and pleasure if we can acknowledge that we need his presence. 2,700 times in the scriptures, the words happiness, joy, bliss are mentioned. He focuses on the reality that he doesn't want you straining. He wants you to receive all that he has created for you to be. And that if you would relax in his relationship, he will uncover the reality of who you are. That happiness is the result of a relationship with an ever-present God who knows how to reveal and transform you into all that he created you to be. Harvard says that happier people are healthier people. They have a better immune system, that they have less heart disease, that they live 10 years longer, they have less mental disturbances, they have a greater resilience to the troubles of life, they have an increased capacity to deal with adversity. Harvard says that happiness leads to an improved mental function. Perhaps we need to understand the benefits of living this happy, good life. Perhaps we need to understand that even the researchers say that happy employees are more productive, they take fewer sick days, that, that they work more consistently, that they change jobs less frequently. Only one-third of Americans today, when asked, said, I'm happy. In fact, by the year 2020, depression is the second leading cause to all disease. You see, I think that perhaps the church needs to change its philosophical view of imposing rules and regulations and expose them to the grace, the mercy, and the kindness of Jesus that will lead them into the reality that they are children of the Most High God. I believe that that is perhaps the greatest work of the 21st century. Because the response to the world generally is to just create more law. 
I'm suggesting that the response to sin is grace and even more grace because the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. I actually think after 40 years of ministry, this may be the challenge of the moment. It may be that we must recognize that everything, say everything, the world was created good and that when a flower blooms, it's good. And in the right habitat, atmosphere, the flower blooms and you go, ah! that, that, that in the right habitat or atmosphere, the eagle soars above the storm. That in the right habitat, in the right atmosphere, in the environment, you have to understand the lion roars. I believe with all of my heart that every human being, if they're given the right atmosphere, the right habitat, that every human being would flourish and manifest the goodness of God that is inerrantly seated inside of every one of us. And I believe that the response to the world is to become communities because we're relational beings is to become communities that create the right atmosphere for people to discover and develop, for people to come into the knowledge and the loving and the becoming. And yet, I think in a world that keeps offering advertisement to change our desires, and in a religious response that just keeps playing more law, I think that this message gets lost somewhere. But I believe that if you can pursue Happiness not for self-gratification, but happiness for others. Christ came desiring others to have life. And that in that self-sacrificing reality, that that's the construct or the habitat, the atmosphere, the environment in which each and every one of us would discover that our common ultimate good is found in communion with God and with each other. And actually, the place where we will discover ourselves, our true selves, the reality of who God created us to be. Did you know you can encourage the goodness and the happiness of other people? That if you begin to live to provide for other people a sense of goodness and happiness and holiness, that you can change the lives of another person according to the scriptures by encouraging one another? By forgiving one another, by bearing one another, by praying for one another, by serving and accepting and admonishing and forgiving and loving one another, you can create an atmosphere where the other person's goodness and blessing is greater than your own. And that in that type of habitat, you would be able, like Michelangelo, to chip away the stone and reveal the David that's on the inside of every one of us but couched in a world that is self-gratifying and in a religious system that just wants to, is now just this gospel message that God loves you and forgives you. And if you walk with me, I'll transform your life Amen. over the course of your life. But see, that gets lost because we'd just as soon pass a law. But I believe that people become what you encourage them to be. I believe they become more what you encourage them than what you nag them. Uh, I wonder this morning, will you distribute that encouragement? Will you express that to other people? Will you call the forgotten kid off the back row to the front row? Will you remind each human being that they were created in the image of God, they were chosen and destined and loved and that God will never stop. I believe that in that atmosphere, Christ came into the world and said, you're my friend. I believe that Christ came into a world that was very pagan, lots of different. Into a world where the law had failed. And I believe Christ came into that world and looked at his disciples and said, I call you my friend. And he said, no greater love have a man than this, than he laid down his life for a friend. To lay down his life. To set aside my own need for the sake of others. To set aside my own opinion. To set aside my own agenda. 
to set that aside and work for the good of another. Hmm. This could save some marriages. I believe this is the gospel and this is the atmosphere in which we recover and are redeemed and restored to God's original intent for our lives. Now, St. Augustine, um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, Kierkegaard, I'm just telling you all this because I've spent nearly 20 years researching. I'm not the first to say this. All of them talk about the different levels of relationship. It says that some friendships have to do with pleasure. Have you ever been around people that are just plain fun? Oh, you didn't get it. Oh, go ahead. Hang out with people that are no fun. See how that works for you. So, some of you need to find somebody that's fun. They tell good jokes. They, they laugh. You know, uh, laughter does good like a medicine. Some relationships have to do with it's just, it's just pleasure. It's just fun. Good fun. Uh, and some relationships have to do with usefulness. You're in business with somebody because they have a contract. They want you to build it. And if you do that, then it's useful to you. Some relationships are useful. Both of those are not bad. But Augustine says something like this. The friendship that God speaks about is the friendship of virtue. Virtue, morality, goodness. I'm going to say this because I know he won't mind it. I have others, but I'm going to say this. For over, coming on nearly 40 years, Terry Webb has loved me and worked for me because he wanted what was best for me. Anita has loved me, cared for me because she wanted good for me. I have loved them and cared for them because I wanted what was good for them. The best relationships work for the virtue of another without self-interest. Are you listening to me? God called us friends, and that friendship required he gave his blood and his body for my good. Mm. I believe that in the habitat, you know what a habitat is? An environment? But it, it comes from the root word habit, that where people have habits that are conducive to the betterment of others. If I have habits that create an atmosphere where others are cared for, in that habitat, people will discover that God is the author of that love and goodness. It has been friendships, not your doctrine, not your denomination, not your law, but it has been other people taking an interest in me, Alexis, and revealing to me that they care deeply about me, even to their own expense. That community is called the church, or should be. And in that place, heaven comes to earth. And for moments, we experience the already and yet the not yet for which we are all aiming for. Because it's impossible to live in that consecutively in the midst of a... But we someday will experience that in its totality. But we can experience it in a place where people understand the gospel as it truly is given. And not the toxic mix that unfortunately is preached most of the time. You do understand that this is an attempt to control you. This is an attempt to free you. Amen. To pursue the good of others, to live in a habit where happiness and goodness are synonymous and that I seek your highest and best for you to realize that you were created by a good God for good reasons and that if you discover that, you really will fly like an eagle, open like a flower, roar like a lion. And in that moment of knowing who you really are and being who God created you to be, that is happiness. Amen. I touch it fleetingly. I touch it spontaneously and sometimes without intent. 
Why do you worship the way you worship? Because Jesus is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Why do you raise your hands and shout? Because I was dead and now I'm alive. And I'm living in the reality of his presence with me now. I, I, I've shared some of this to some of you before, but I'm going to do it again because it bears repeating over and over and over again. What does that? I have people tell me, you need to be more practical. Okay, here comes practical. I've talked to you philosophically. I've talked to you theologically. Now I'm going to talk to you very practically. How do you create an atmosphere of true friendship that's for the sake of another? How do you do that so that that person can realize that God loves them? How do I do that? Number one, I, I think we need to listen intentionally. There was a woman. She had been sick for 13 years, 12 or 13 years. She had been isolated in her room because the law had told her she was impure and she couldn't come into public. She had been rejected and abandoned and left alone. And she suffered for over a decade. But she heard about this Jesus. And in Mark's chapter 5's gospel, he comes into town and she risks everything to go out and find the Christ. But because she had been rejected so many times, she tried to sneak in. I got to tell you, after 40 years of pastoring, I watch people sneak in here. Watch him. And she snuck up behind him. And she thought she would touch him and just see, maybe God would. And she touched him. And it says instantly her issue was healed. Wow. If you've snuck in here this morning, I'm praying that you'll instantly. That addiction will be broken. That instantly you'll be set free from that trauma. I believe that instantly. And then she thought she'd sneak away. But Jesus turned around and said, who did that? Who did that? I, I, the Bible says she shook and trembled with fear because she didn't want to be embarrassed, put down, ridiculed. But, but she said, it, it, that, was, that was me. Sometimes I'm known for saying, okay, if you got something this morning, would you raise your hand? But some people are afraid to do that because then they'll think other people think they're a quack. It's me. And he did something more profound than the healing. He said, ma'am, tell me your story. You know what people really want? They want you to listen to their story. More than the healing was the fact that he took the time to listen to her story. Do you know what America is not doing today? Hey, I'm being real practical. Offend you or not, I don't care. They're not listening to each other. They each got their ideals and they're just shouting at one another. They're not listening to the other's story. You know why marriages break down? Because people don't listen to each other's story. Here's Jairus needing his little girl to be healed. In fact, his daughter is going to die while Jesus is listening to this crazy woman. <laughs> but he takes the time. Oh, here's another practical thing. Don't interrupt somebody if they're telling your, their story. Sometimes I wish we could shut the mic off. I mean, you know, it's like, I'm telling my story. Shut up. Listen intentionally to one another. In an atmosphere where we appreciate each other's journey. And he, notice how quiet it gets in here. <sighs> Number two. Uh, he, he, wait a minute, before I move on. And then he gave her the greatest compliment. He said, daughter, your faith did that. Just a few moments ago, nobody wanted to be around her. And now the Son of God is calling her his daughter. I wish we'd call each other brothers and sisters a bit quicker. 
we wait to see if they behave before we acknowledge our relationship. But I'll... <laughs> Number two, the habitat, the atmosphere wherein people can discover their goodness and the happiness in which God has created for them to develop in. Let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and encouragement. In other words, let's encourage... I, I think we need to praise people abundantly. I think rather than criticizing each other, we need to praise each other. You didn't hear me. Listen, I could speak to people who know something about children and conscious discipline. Did you know you'll get the behavior that you praise? If you would tend to praise people and find the thing or two that they do that is really good, if you would praise that with great intention, you would recover. It's a great story that Gary Smalley tells about Jenny. Jenny's four years old and mom and dad are exasperated with Jenny. Jenny's a pain in the behind and Jenny is, and the, and, and the mother says to the dad, you, you got to do something with this kid. So dad takes the kid to breakfast one morning and all the while that the kid is eating waffles with syrup and stuff on it, he is bragging about Jenny, about how Jenny, we, we prayed for you. We love you. We think you're wonderful. You're the best daughter that anybody could have. We are so grateful that you're in our life. And he goes on and on and on. And when he stops, Jenny goes, longer? More, Daddy, more. A few days later, Mom tells a story that Jenny comes up to her and says, I'm wonderful because Dad told me you and Mom that you, Dad, think I'm the best little girl in the world. Do you know how many people just need to be praised and complimented and appreciated and encouraged and uplifted? Do you know how many people need that rather than people pointing out what they think to be sin based on the law? Hmm. Number three, I, I think there has to be an atmosphere of gratitude. I don't think there's much gratitude in the world today. I don't think you can find it there. I, I think that within the context of Christianity uh, that I've discovered that gratitude is my life preserver. That when I feel life closing in and me sinking, that Tyler, if I can find something to be grateful to, I can bounce back up and get another breath. That, that, that we have to begin to develop this habit of listening this habit of praising, and this habit of being grateful. And that in the midst of a negative world, choosing to be grateful equals choosing to be happy. Because you can't be grateful and be unhappy at the same time. That it's a choice that can constantly and continually needs to be renewed in my mind until a grateful spirit becomes a reflective response to all of life. There's so many people going through life going, why? Can I tell you, if Annie and I have one more thing break down, I'm serious. We, we get halfway to a, on a trip a couple days ago, and, and, and Rachel calls me, and there's water coming up in the middle of the living room of the little house she lives in that was Annie's mom. And where does water come up in the middle of the floor and come up, you know, and what pipe? It, no, there's nothing down there. It's just bubbling up in the middle of that concrete floor. And it's like, how many more issues, you know, the, this car broke down, this person doesn't like this, this person doesn't get along with that, this is going on, it got, you know. Have you ever been in that moment? Yes. Why me, Lord? What's happening? Am I under a curse? I love people who are chasing family curses. <laughs> I, maybe you didn't get the message, I'm born again. I'm adopted into a different family. This whole crap about generational curses was broken the minute you were baptized into the family of Jesus Christ. Would you quit allowing religious midgets to put that on you? Oh, but if I believe in that, okay, then you'll experience it. I refuse. When I got born again, he died, I was raised. My family heritage is now Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yeah, but what about your mom? I, Jesus, 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 Jesus. 
I could say Mary and Joseph, but that would have been. I think that truly we underappreciate the things, the benefits that God has given to us. For he daily loads us with benefits. Psalm 103, I pray it every morning, uh, forget not all of his benefits. To praise always, to abound in thanksgiving, to in everything give thanks and prayer. To live eucharistically in the reality that all of life I'm thankful for. Do you understand that the, one of the reasons I live in the communion of the bread and wine is to take something and say thank you, is to transform it from what it just is into something more. That if I'm grateful for Annie, she's more than just a physical being to me didn't get it. She's more than a sex object. She's more than a housekeeper. That if you are thankful, grateful that the Spirit of God comes on that thing and that thing is more than it was before you were thankful. You're supposed to live your whole life transforming all of this into something more. Thankful for the sun coming up. Thankful for the breath that you breathe. Thankful for everything and everything be grateful it's the doorway into happiness to listen to another to praise another and to be grateful to God you, you, you do understand <laughs> happiness is a renewable energy joy is a renewable energy and when you plug it into gratitude it'll be renewed Boy, you're quiet this morning. I either completely missed the ship or you're trying to soak something up. I don't. And listen, gratitude is more than an attitude. You have to put it into action. You can't just think. Did you know one leper got restored? There were 10 of those dudes that had leprosy, but only the one that came back and said thank you was completely restored. Fingers grew back. That, that, that gratitude, not only, it's more than the healing, it's... It's the restoration of who you were in the wholeness of your creation. That to live in that way is to rejoice in everything. That gratitude is the way you should start your day, spend your day, and look back at your day. So let me sum it up. God created you good. He called you very good. Ingratitude, self-gratification as they reach for something is what began to cover up that goodness. And only in the habitat of his relationship of grace and mercy, only if you drill down into friends that really care more about you than about themselves, only in that atmosphere can you discover his goodness that's inerrant within you and then let it grow into full maturity where that you can soar like the eagle, open like the flower, roar like the lion. And that the habits that are constitutive of that are listening to others, praising others, and being grateful for everything. That's how you walk in the Spirit. I could say it with different language. That's how you walk and live in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of Christ that's within us. Hmm. That's the church that I desire to pastor. And I, I've seen moments of it, great moments of it. Uh, and, and I want it to be the norm for our lives because I want every one of you to flourish and be your best, to be that human being that reveals the goodness and the mercy and the greatness of God because he's the source of all of that. Amen. So you've heard me do this a few times before. I, I challenge you. I challenge you to do it for seven days. I challenge you to do it for a month. It, it's a three-step process that I began to use several years ago as I was counseling husbands and wives, but I, I can just say it to you in general. Number one, uh, for the next 30 days, purpose not to say anything negative about your spouse, not to him, not about him, let me say it this way, purpose not to say anything negative about anybody. Probably the first week you'll be silent all week. 
you won't have anything to say. But I'm serious. Take negativity out of your tongue. Just take it out. Number two, is he got it up there? Number two, every day for the next 30 days, express at least one thing you admire or appreciate about your spouse or anybody, everybody. Say it to them and then to someone else about them. It's not just to Tyler that I think Tyler's a great singer. I tell other people, I think Tyler's a great singer. Brag about people. Don't say anything negative and find something to brag about. One, two, three. Repeat one and two until it's a reflex. <laughs> Repeat it until it's just your habit. Repeat it until anytime somebody says negative, you just walk away. Repeat it until when you walk up somebody, you're thinking of something that you like about that person. Many, many years ago, I went to a Zig Ziglar conference. And as we walked in, they handed us this little piece of paper that says, I like you because. And you had to fill it out and hand it to somebody. I think I'll have them printed and put in the church. <laughs> I like you. You know how many people have looked at me and gone, that's hard. Oh, you need saved. God wants you to be happy. The question is, what is it you desire? Because most of what we desire is not good for us. So we have to evaluate those things. That's why Jesus said, what do you want? What do you want? What do you desire? I want what's best for Ann. I want what's good for my kids. I want what's, that's what I want. Jesus wanted you to be forgiven. Jesus wanted you to be healed, even at the expense of his own life. That's the story. And then he calls us to follow that path and imitate him until we become like him. Now, that is the gospel. Some of you may have prayed a while ago, Jesus is Lord. Can I invite you to be baptized? Can I invite you to be perfectly embarrassed? as a demarcation that the old is gone and the new has come. Can I invite you to walk in this grace, to walk in this reality? I I'm here to tell you, you'll have moments of, and then you'll have moments where you don't. Because it won't be in its fullness until we arrive in heaven.